All right, uh, beginning half of chapter four, we're talking about force system resultants. Okay, the entirety of chapter four is about force system resultants, which is essentially taking all of the forces acting on a given body and reducing those into a single resultant force and a single resultant moment. Okay, we haven't talked about moment yet in this course, so we'll do a little bit of a review. Okay, so if I have a three-dimensional coordinate system here, x, y, and z, all right, and somewhere on, on the y-axis here, I have a force applied, okay? This thing, the force applied directly upward, is going to cause whatever the system is to rotate, again, this is counterclockwise around the x-axis. Okay, things can rotate around the x-axis, they can rotate around the y-axis, or they can rotate around the z-axis, depending on how the forces are applied and how the rotation can happen. Can also rotate in any of the three direct, three, uh, about any of the three axes uh, at once, again, more than one axis at once, which is going to allow rotation in any of the, in any direction we need it to happen, or any direction that it can happen. So we're going to have a distance here, dy, which is the distance from the origin, okay? This dy, this distance from the origin is going to be called our moment arm, which is simply the distance from the axis of rotation to the applied force. Okay. So in this case, we're just using our origin. Uh, the x-axis is our, as our uh, axis of rotation. F is our applied force. The distance between them, dy, is going to be our um, is going to be our moment. This causes, this is our origin, so it causes rotation about point O. Again, about the origin. This force would also cause an upward moment, but uh, no, upward motion, okay? But at this point, all we're really concerned about is the moment, okay? So, moment has A magnitude and direction. I.e., it is a vector. Okay, the definition is a little strange here in terms of the um, in terms of the direction of the the vector, but the magnitude is fairly straightforward. The magnitude is simply equal to F times D. Okay, that's the magnitude of the force times the moment arm. Okay, the direction, uh, which is the, uh, this is actually an important dis 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 distinction here. This is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the applied force. Okay. Uh, if this force were applied up here, it would still be this distance that matters. Okay, we'll see that in a couple more examples. It is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the applied force. Okay, the moment arm here is still the perpendicular distance. The direction is determined by the right-hand rule. Okay, there's several variations of the right-hand rule depending on what context you're in. They all work. It's all essentially dealing with cross products, which we'll see in a minute. The, the uh, moment is a cross product. In this case, it's generally easiest to use your fingers, sort of your hand, right hand again, shaped sort of like the thumbs up. In this case, you want to curl your fingers in the direction of rotation. In this case, as I look at the board, this force would cause this thing to rotate counterclockwise. My thumb points in the direction of the moment vector in this case, straight out of the board. This moment, this force, is causing a moment in the positive x direction, okay? Most of the time, we'll be able to talk about 
uh, moments being clockwise or counterclockwise, and that's a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier to sort out. But in the stricter sense, something that is, in this case, counterclockwise about the x-axis causes a moment in the positive x-axis. If this force were downward and causing a clockwise rotation, it would be in the negative x-axis. Okay? If I were to move my force over here, if I were to say this force is acting, uh, let's say it's acting here on the x-axis, this is going to cause a rotation this way, correct? Again, so I can curl my hand, I stand over here now, I'm curling my hand in this way, Okay, it's spinning in this direction, is the way it would cause motion. That is a negative z direction for a moment. My moment vector would be negative z, i.e. a clockwise rotation around the z-axis. Okay, sometimes it's a little trickier to see. The right-hand rule can help you keep things a little bit straight. Okay, so we'll go through a couple of quick examples here. Of easy moment scenarios. Okay, resultant moment, first of all, that's important. Okay, each force produces a moment. Okay, when you calculate the total moment acting on an object, you need to account for every force. Some forces will contribute zero moment, i.e. we can kind of neglect those. But you do need to check each force to make sure if it does, uh, if it does produce a moment, um, a non-zero moment, then you need to include it. Okay, and the total moment is obviously just the sum of each individual moment. This is, let me rephrase, vector sum. So if we have one, let me take another case here, go up just x and y. I have one force trying to cause it has a tendency to cause rotation in the, uh, in the counterclockwise direction. I have another force applied here that's going to cause rotation in the positive and the clock, uh, clockwise direction. Those two, when you add those together, obviously one of those will become negative. And with the regular right-handed sign convention, the, counter, uh, sorry, the clockwise one will be considered negative. Again, sign conventions aren't terribly important as long as you stay consistent. Uh, if it makes sense for you to be clockwise positive and counterclockwise negative, for the most part, that'll work fine. Uh, again, as long as you stay consistent. But with the right-handed coordinate system that we typically use, and that you will see in your textbook, counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. That will also produce the positive vector for the right-hand rule as well. All right, so a few examples of moments. Start with as simple as it gets. We have an origin, we have a beam, we have a beam that's two meters long, we have an applied force at the end of 100 newtons. Finding the moment about point O is equal to force times distance, which equals force is 100 newtons. The distance, it is distance is perpendicular from the force. Again, the force is along this vertical line. Perpendicular distance would be horizontal. So this is two meters. This equals 200 meters. Okay, and you either need to specify positive or negative. This is clockwise, so it's negative. I find it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more clear if you actually just give me an arrow. Okay, so this is uh, showing me it is a clockwise moment. Okay, because if you leave, if you don't put a sign in here, I can't assume any positive or negatives. If you put a plus or a minus, then I'll assume positive is. Uh, counterclockwise and negative is, is clockwise, but something like this I would not automatically assume positive. You need to actually put the plus sign in there to actually specify direction. Okay, again, I'm not going to treat the positive sign as implied. Uh, I'll do another one here. 
So we've got do origin again. Do this a little differently. We have an angled beam now. This is two meters. This is 0.7, no, that's in there to there, 0.75 meters from there to there. And we have a 50 Newton force applied there. Moment about O. In this case, it's going to be the force, again, F times D. The force is 50 Newtons. The moment arm is, again, the perpendicular distance. The force is acting horizontally, so we care about the vertical distance. So this 2 meters actually doesn't contribute anything at all to the moment. This 0.75, this vertical distance, is all that matters. So this is 0.75 meters. To help make that maybe a little bit more clear, if I drew the equivalent without that 0.75 meters, so this is 2 meters to this point, and then I had a 50 newton force acting on that, that would not tend to cause any rotation at all. That would cause this piece to move to the left, but would not cause rotation. You need some sort of uh, perpendicular distance to cause a moment, to cause a rotation. So this ends up being 50 times 0.75 is 37.5 newton meters. And this is still trying to rotate clockwise. Okay, continuing with a couple more fairly simple ones. So if I have origin here, we have this beam that is three feet and a not to scale 45 degrees, one foot long beam going in this direction. Then I'm going to have an applied force, which I'm going to do in a different color, of 60 pounds. Okay. This is a little different, and so again, moment about L is equal to F times D. The force is 60. The perpendicular distance is, is this distance here, is what we care about. Okay. Well, we can make a triangle out of this. Oops, oops if I draw the triangle in the right spot. Triangle out of this, we care about this vertical distance here, so that's going to be what well, we can say the sine of 45 is equal to, again, opposite over hypotenuse, it is this d over 1, or 1 foot. So d is going to equal 1 foot times the sine of 45. Degrees. So that can go in here. 60 pounds times 1 foot times the sine of 45 degrees. Well, that ends up equaling 42.4. And this is foot pounds, or pound foot, it doesn't really matter. And this is causing a rotation. We're pulling this way, it's going to cause a rotation counterclockwise. Okay. So in that case we had to do a little trick to find the to find the moment arm, to find the perpendicular distance. But ultimately it ended up the same process. Okay. Uh, take a look at another one here. So we have uh, 0.0 again. We're gonna go over here. Now we're gonna have a little roller support here wheel or whatever on the ground holding this up. Then we're still going to have four feet here to the support. And then we're going to have an upward angle here for two feet to the end of the beam. This is a 30 degree angle. And then my applied force, I'm going to do in blue again, is hanging down here at 40 pounds. Okay, so the moment about point O is F times D. D in this case is this entire distance. Okay, 
the force is vertical, we're talking about the horizontal distance from point O to where the force is applied. So D now equals 4 plus one leg of this triangle here, this little leg of this triangle here. Okay, well that is going to be 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, so there's two pieces of my moment arm here. The first piece is from here to here and is 4 feet. The next piece is right here, okay, and that's the, uh, the horizontal leg of this triangle, which has a length of 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees. So then that becomes a simple F times D. F is still 40 pounds. D is 4 plus 2 cosine of 30 degrees. And this is in feet. Okay. And that ends up equaling, once you do the algebra out, 229 foot-pounds, and this downward force is causing a rotation in the clockwise direction. Okay, one more example, and then we'll add one or two more. As they get a little bit more complicated. So not so bad. Move the origin around a little bit, make a vertical thing here, and we're going to go up over, down, uh, not time king man, but we're going to have a 7 kilonewton force applied here. This distance is 1 meter, this distance is 2 meters, and the total height here is 4 meters. Okay, this one's actually a little easier than the last one, I think. Again, moment of out O is equal to F times D. Force is 7 kilonewtons. Moment arm, again the perpendicular distance between the force, which is horizontal, and point O. So it's the vertical distance. So this distance here. Okay, so this 2 meters doesn't matter at all. The moment arm is this 4 minus 1 is 3 meters, which is 21 kilonewton, put this down here where you can see it, 21 kilonewton meters, and that is going to be, again, we're pushing this way. This gets a little confusing, because you notice we're, we're, O is our axis of rotation, so we are going to rotate counterclockwise. It's a little counterintuitive sometimes. You look at this and you say, oh, it's going to rotate this way. No, we got to remember we're rotating that point O, so this force is going to cause it to rotate counterclockwise. And moving on, we'll do one last one before I start talking about stuff that involves a couple of moments here. Oh, this one is so that's fine. So we have now we have point O. We have a beam here that then takes a bend over here. This is three meters. We have two meters to the center, and another two meters to the end. And there's going to be a force in the middle, which is why I did that the way I did. This angle here is 30 degrees. Now we're going to label our forces. We're going to have four different forces acting on this beam. Acting there, we're going to have 50 newtons. Pulling straight out here, we're going to have 60 newtons. Pulling straight out to the right here, we have 20 newtons. And pulling down here, we have 40 newtons. Okay. So we're going to have four components to the four forces here that are going to contribute to the moment. Okay, so moment about point O. This force is going to create a moment. So that's FD is 50. Newtons times 2 meters. Okay, 
This one is causing a moment that is clockwise, which means we need to make it negative. Okay, clockwise is negative, counterclockwise is positive to stay um, consistent with that. The 60 Newton force. 60 perpendicular, oops, and I'll label the units on that. Perpendicular distance, this is horizontal, and it's right along the line of the force, it's right along the line of action here. There's no moment arm here. This 60 Newton force is pulling to the right, but it's not causing any rotation. There's zero moment arm here. This term drops out. So there is no moment caused by the 60 Newton force. We could have left it out entirely. Uh, I included it just to be able to explain why. All right, well, we're going to need this triangle here for this next piece. All right, so we have three meters and we have a 30 degree angle there. We'll need that. So we'll start with the easier one here. We'll go with the 20 Newton force. So the 20 Newton force, I'll start with plus, it's 20 Newtons times the perpendicular distance here. Well, the force is horizontal, which means we care about the vertical distance. So that's going to be this distance here, this y. Okay? And that is equal to 3 times the sine of 30 degrees. And that's in meters. Okay? This is causing rotation about here. It's going to cause rotation counterclockwise. So it is positive. The last term here is our 40 Newton force, uh, plus, maybe I'll check that in a second, 40 Newtons. This distance here is going to be 2 plus 2 plus this distance x. So 4 plus x ends up being 3 cosine 30. So 4 plus 3 cosine 30 degrees, and that's in meters. Okay, 40 Newtons. About here is causing a rotation that is counter, uh, sorry, that is clockwise, which means we need to make this negative. So this giant mess with four terms, one for each force, contributes to the total moment about 0.0. So negative 50 times 2 is negative 100 newton meters. This drops out. 20 times 3 sine 30 is, sine 30 is 1 half, so 30, this is plus. 30 newton meters minus 40 times 4 plus that mass um, is something I don't remember off the top of my head. I didn't write down. So 4 plus 3 cosine 30 is 6.6 .6 times 40 and negative 263.9. Newton meters. Okay, so of these four forces, the 60 Newton force produces the smallest amount of moment, produces no moment at all. Largest force is producing the smallest moment. The next one is the 20 Newton force is only causing a 30 Newton moment in the counterclockwise direction. Again, it's a relatively small force, relatively small moment. We have a 50 Newton force that's producing 100 Newton meters clockwise. Uh, and then we have a 40 Newton force that's producing two, or more than two and a half times as much moment. And that's because of the much greater moment arm. So again, the force, uh, the moment arm is obviously equally as important as the force in determining the moment. This ends up equaling a negative 3, uh, what is it, 339? 334, 333.9. Newton meters, or... 339, oops, 333.9 Newton meters, and this is negative, which means clockwise. Okay, so when we've got a problem with four different moments, we can add those up. It sums. Um, find the moments individually the same way, find each moment individually the same way we did when we only had one force, and add them together. Okay, so we'll take a look at. One more dealing with a solid beam instead of just these lines. And we'll start talking about moments about axes. Okay. So we've still got our solid wall here. Now we're going to have a 
beam. Okay, this is going to be three meters long. We're going to have a thickness on this beam. Uh, we're going to have a thickness on this beam of point. Point five meters top to bottom. And on this corner, we're going to have a force applied downward at 45 degree angle with a magnitude of 4 kilonewtons. Okay, we are actually trying to find a moment about point O, which is the left middle of this beam. Well, we could actually try and find this. We could extend this over here and find perpendicular distance. That's the hard way to do this problem. Easier way is when we have a force acting at an angle is to split it into its components and find the moment of each component individually. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to take this force. I'm going to make an X component and a Y component. I'll call that FX and FY. Okay, FX and FY are easy enough. Fine, we've done that a hundred times. So Fx is equal to 4 kilonewtons times the cosine of 45. F of y is 4 kilonewtons times the sine of 45 degrees. Okay, so that gives us our forces. Now we need to find the moment arms. Okay, that's easy enough. So we'll do moment about O. is equal to the moment due to F force x, which is Fx, times the distance, the perpendicular distance from Fx to the center, well, to the, sorry, the perpendicular distance from Fx to the uh, axis of rotation. And that is half the, again, the distance from here to here, which is 0.25 meters. Again, we care about the distance from this line to this point, so it's only 0.25. Plus, again, this is causing rotation. Sorry, checking direction here. About This is actually going to cause rotation counterclockwise. Again, if I pin this here and try and pull this here, it's going to rotate counterclockwise just a bit. So that does remain positive. Fy, okay, Fy has the moment arm, it's 3 meters, okay? Even though I drew Fy over here, it's still technically applied right here. So this is the distance we care about is from here to here, which is our 3 meters. Okay, this one is causing a rotation that is clockwise, so this needs to be negative. Okay, so our two forces here, are F of X is trying to cause it to rotate uh, counterclockwise, contributing a positive moment, but with very little moment arm, because it's very close to actually being along the same line. F of y, F and sorry, F in the y direction, is going to have a much larger moment arm and is rotating uh, clockwise. So this becomes pretty straightforward. Fx is 4 kilonewtons times cosine of 45 times 0.25 meters minus Fy is 4 kilonewtons times sine of 45 times 3 meters. You want to solve that out. We end up with a uh, negative 7.21 kilonewtons. Kilonewton meters, sorry. Which could also equal 7.21 kilonewton meters clockwise. So that gives us our answer. All right, so that's, uh, that's about it for two-dimensional moments. Uh, when we deal with two dimensions, it's usually pretty easy to talk in terms of clockwise and counterclockwise, positive and negative. When we deal with three-dimensional moments, thing gets a things get a little bit more tricky. Um, and I generally recommend trying to get away from trying to think counterclockwise, clockwise. You can do it on some simple problems if you've got uh, forces that are causing uh, rotation. It's pretty easy to see around one particular axis. You can work with that, and we'll see that when we get to some of the examples in class. But the safer way to do a three-dimensional moment problem is actually to do it in terms of the vectors and the cross products. So
So if I take a look at the force vector formulation of the mole. Okay. This is the formal definition of moment. This will work in any case, any situation. What we've, doing, but, but what we've been doing up till now is sort of a simplified version that works in two dimensions very well, solves easy problems. Uh, anytime that starts falling apart, you can always go back to the, the formal definition, which will work in any case. In which case, moment about O is equal to R cross F, where R, and this is what makes this a little bit more pow powerful, is we don't have to worry about uh, perpendicular distances or anything goofy like that. R is the position vector from O to any point on the line of action Okay, so essentially what we're dealing with here is this works for the, the simplified case here is we have the ones we were looking at a moment ago. We have point O, we have R, we have F. Okay, R cross F in this case is equal to R, F, sine theta. Again, in a two-dimensional world, RF sine theta does work. So we have R times F. This is 90 degrees. This goes to 1. So this just equals R times F, i.e. exactly the same thing we had before, force times the moment arm here. Now, still working in two dimensions, if I look at the case on the next page, where I have F over here, okay, this will say is R1. We've got R2 here. But R3, let me make up my F a little longer here, here. So we still have moment of auto equals R cross F. This is still a two-dimensional problem, so we can still write this as R F sine theta, okay? But you'll notice we can rewrite this as F times R sine theta. Just pulling out that, that term. R sine theta R1 times the sine of theta is just going to be R1 times 1. R2 times the sine of theta, this is theta 1, this is theta 2, this is theta 3. Oops, I should do this correctly. Let's see what I dropped. This is theta 1, this is theta 2, this is theta 3. Okay. Again, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, they show up over here as well. But these are theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. As these angles get smaller, these distances get larger, and it happens proportionally. So as these r's get larger, as we get further up here, r2 is longer than r1, r3 is longer than r2. But these angles get smaller, so this sine term drops as well. r sine theta is always going to equal this perpendicular distance. Okay, R sine, R2 sine theta 2 will equal the length of R1. R3 sine theta 3 will equal the length of R, R1. So essentially, you're not going to have to do anything with this. This is just to show that because of the properties of the sine and the moment arm, we can get away with using any point on the line of action of F. We don't have to find the perpendicular distance. 
that gets very handy in three dimensions when finding that perpendicular distance becomes very, very difficult. Okay. So this is actually called the principle of transmissivity. Transmissibility, sorry. Again, we're really not doing anything with this principle other than showing that we can use any point on the line, line of action and explaining why we can use that. Okay. But what this does allow us to do is use r cross f for any, for any moment calculation. So if you know the moment arm, again, any, any position vector from the origin or your axis rotation to your line of action, and you know your force, you can do your um, you can do a moment for any individual force. Okay, um, and again, cross product we address in chapter two. So, but, all right. One of the last things we need to talk about in this section is that instead of talking about a moment about an individual point O, is moment about an axis. A lot of the time, this will be fairly easy. Okay? If we have, again, our three-dimensional coordinate system, anytime you're finding moment about an axis, you're essentially going to have to be working in three dimensions. Okay? Moment, um, in this case, if we have x, y, and z. If I take even the simplest case I have, I have a beam, and I have a force applied on it. Okay? We talked, this was the first example I called this dy. I think I drew the force up top earlier, it's fine. Um, it applies the same way. This is going to cause a moment about the x-axis. We can call this a moment either about the origin or it's going to twist about the x-axis. The idea being that this will cause this beam to rotate counterclockwise about the x-axis, i.e. it's going to stay in this uh, uh, dy plane uh, rotating fixed about the x-axis. A lot of the time you can do this. If I were to put another force applied down right here, I could say, okay, this is going to cause rotation around x this time in the clockwise direction. We can just uh, analyze this as we would a simple moment problem. What this gets me when this gets messy is if your force is not along one of the cardinal axes, or if we're trying to find a force along an axis that is not one of our original, uh, is not one of our orthogonal axis here. So if I had my nice, or not so nice, x, y, and z. Okay, if I have my x, y, and z here, and I have my beam that's now going to extend this way, and I have a force that's applied straight upward, and I've tried to ask you to find the force around the line, about some line, or whatever, even, even the, sorry, the moment about some line, or the moment about the x-axis. For this case, it does get quite a bit more difficult. It's not quite as easy to see. It's, it's easier to get, come up with a, uh, a formulated calculation for it. Fortunately, there is such a thing, and it is quite easy. Okay? Just like we talked about um, in the first week, when we talked about the finding the component of a force along a line, this is finding the component of a moment along a line. So if we have moment about an axis, axis A, is going to equal, well, when we found the force, the component of a force acting along a line, it was the force dot producted with the unit vector of that line. This is the same thing. It's going to be the unit vector of that along the axis of that line, dot producted with the moment. And unfortunately, the moment's a big mess here is R cross F. Okay. So what that looks like, well, R cross F we typically do as a determinant of I, J, K, and then Rx, Ry, Rz, Fx, Fy. Fz. 
Now you can evaluate this and then do the dot product, but there is a shortcut for this. Putting the dot product in here simply gets rid of the ijk and replaces it with the unit vector here. So instead of our ijk unit vectors, we're going to end up with the unit vector coordinates for this. So this ends up being the determinant of uax, uay, I'll keep these capitals to stay consistent, and uaz. Then we have rx, ry, rz, I should have left what I had before, fx, fy, fz, and from there we find the determinant as we normally would. Okay? And this gives us the moment along the, um, the moment about axis A. Okay, so, and then if you want the moment, oops, this is a vector. If you want the magnitude of the moment about A, this is obviously just uh, the vector divided by its unit vector. Okay, that gives you the magnitude there. For any system of forces, for any system of forces, the moment about A, about axis A, is equal to the summation of, unfortunately there's no shortcut for this, you literally have to do the, moment, the dot product R cross F for each force, and this goes here. So for each force, you do R cross F dotted with A, then you add them together once you have the moment. You have moments that are positive and negative direction around the axis, whether you're turning clockwise or clockwise around the axis. Again, this allows you to find moment about a given axis, if it's not something that's immediately obvious, like our first simple that sample there where I had mo a moment about the x and, uh, x and y axis. If you have a force that's nice and perpendicular to one of our cardinal axes, you can oftentimes evaluate moment about one of the other axes without doing this process. Um, but this is always going to work regardless of your ability to, to picture what happens in three dimensions based on a two dimensional drawing. Okay, so. No, let's just say, let's do one show here. I have a, this will just be more of a math problem, I think, but we'll give it a shot. We have x, y, and z. We're going to have a force that starts at point, um, dun, 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 where am I going to put that point? That is going to be at point negative three, comma, uh, four, comma, six. And the force acts in this direction, F equals minus 40i plus 20j plus 10k in newtons. All right, and I want to find, I'm going to give you an axis A. Axis A has a vector, uh, we'll say, what are we going to do here? Where is it? I'm going to go negative 3. We're going to go, say, this is, we'll make it nice and easy. This is going to be axis A is to point A, which is uh, 3, comma, 0. What do we want to do here? Three comma negative three four zero. Okay, so axis A is well vector A. Axis A is the unit vector along the direction of A. Oops, not magnitude. Unit vector along the direction A which equals vector, the position vector A divided by the magnitude of A. Okay, again, finding the unit vector in the direction of A is equal to, well, 
this is simply minus 3i plus 4j. And then there's 0k term, I'll leave that out. Okay, magnitude, uh, you could do this out if you need to. Uh, it is a Pythagorean triple, but I'll show it. So magnitude of a is equal to square root of 3 squared, negative 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 0 squared. This equals 5. Okay, so we end up with over 5. So this ends up equaling our unit vector a along the, sorry, unit vector along the axis of a is negative 3 fifths i plus 4 fifths j. Okay, so we have our unit vector along the axis a. So to backtrack a little bit here, we have point a. We want to find the moment created by this force around the OA axis. Okay, this is confusing. So we have, say we have some sort of structure that can only rotate around this line, this OA line. So it can only rotate around this line. We want to find out how much rotation is caused by that force. So we need to find the unit vector along that line, which we just did. This is the unit vector along OA. So that's that piece. Now we need to find the moment created by this force. Okay. Well, we have OA, we have F. The total formulation here, moment about the axis, about axis A, is equal to U A times, sorry, dot product, times R cross F. Okay. F is our force, we know it. Mom uh, unit vector along our axis, we've got that. What we need is our moment arm. And again, moment arm is the distance from any point on this axis to any point on this force. Okay, moment arm in this case, it used to be from the origin to any point along the line of the force. In this case, because our origin is a line, again, where our axis of rotation is actually an axis, we can find from any point along this line. The easiest way to do that is just to treat R as our origin is on our axis of rotation, which we care about, and connect that to the one point on here that we know. So this is R. Okay, so we're connecting one point on our axis of rotation line to one point on the line of action of our force. Okay, so now this R is quite easily negative 3i plus 4j plus 6k. Alright, so now we have r, f, and ua. Well, what about a? Is equal to the determinant here. ua is negative 3 fifths i times 4 plus 4 fifths j, 0k. Then we have r is negative 3, 4, 6. And then negative f is negative 40, 20, 10. Okay, I left the i, j's, and k's off these because when we do the determinant, um, when we multiply i by i, it's just going to drop out. Um, so we're gonna. So I only wanted to leave one set of the, the unit vectors, the, um, the Cartesian unit vectors in there. We evaluate this again: three fifths i times uh, forty minus one twenty. We go through here. We end up with a unit vector of. This ends up equaling. Sorry, we got a big trouble here. Um, well, let's do it. Out. So people can see a little practice with the determinant if they need it. This comes around here. Okay, so we have, when we use the negative 3 fifths i times 4 times 10 minus 6 times 20, then we have minus, the next term is 4 fifths j times negative 3 times 10 is negative 30. Oops. Minus negative 4, 40 times 6 is negative 240. Minus negative 240 is plus 240. 
0 times whatever this equals, doesn't matter, it's plus 0. Okay, this ends up equaling, this ends up equaling negative 120, no, so this is negative 80 times, negative 120 times negative 3 fifths i plus 4 fifths j. Okay. So this tells us that it is acting along the unit vector a, that makes sense, and has a magnitude of 120, and this is newtons and meters. So we have our moment vector. The magnitude we get, we divided by, uh, by the unit vector, and the unit vector is negative 3 fifths i minus plus 4 fifths j. That'll leave us with a magnitude of just negative 120. Okay, so that's a moment about an axis. That is the toughest piece of this section. The last piece I have to talk about is moment due to a couple, which is one of the easiest pieces of this section. couple is two parallel forces with the same magnitude but opposite directions. The reason we tell, call these a couple, and the reason why they're important, is if I have an object, the simplest couple is just two forces along the same line. Okay, if for these two forces, I'm going to do this a little bit differently, equal and opposite forces pull it, pushing along the same line, this is not going to cause any motion at all. Force pushing left, pushing right, they're going to cancel out. There's not going to be any translation of motion. In this case, they also don't cause any rotation motion. This is not going to cause anything at all. These two forces cancel out completely. When this gets interesting, in terms of moment, is when you have the two forces when they aren't on the same line. Notice it just says parallel, not on the same line. So I can have this force acting here, this force acting here. Say this is 10 pounds, and this is 10 pounds. In terms of translational motion, side to side, up and down, back and forth, these two cancel. They're not going to cause any motion side to side. What this is going to cause is rotation. Okay, this is going to cause this object to rotate. Okay, the moment due to a couple, and this is going to be, I'll call the distance, I'll make this a little bit more general in terms of drawing. If I have two forces, both of magnitude f, with distance d in between them. This is a little confusing. Um, because D, what we were talking about is the moment arm before, now we're talking about the distance between two forces. Um, it still works in terms of a moment arm, because if you find the, hold on a second, we'll say the moment caused by a couple, the moment is equal to f times d, which is why we keep things as d. If you look at this, if I wanted to find the moment about this point, this force would generate no moment. There's no moment on. This force would be f times d. If I were to change it up, I can't write from that side, if I were to change it up and try and find moment about this point, okay, this force would generate no moment, and this one would be force times d. I wanted to find the moment about the point in the middle. The upper force would be force times half the distance. This one would be force times half the distance. You add those together, and you get force times distance. So it doesn't matter where 
you put this point within these two, between these two lines, you're going to get the same moment. What's interesting is if you look at it out here. Okay, now we're going to have this, this force causing a counterclockwise moment, this force causing a slightly larger clockwise moment. Okay, it's still going to cause an overall clockwise moment that's still equal to F times D. That's what makes this unique. Okay, this is equal to R cross F. This is a free vector. Meaning, this couple, this moment, can be applied anywhere, which usually has a W in it, in the system. Okay, so it's just going to be this F times D, where F is the magnitude of one of the forces, and D is the distance between them. Okay, because they don't cause any translational motion, they, um, it's just going to be a lot of rotation. It doesn't matter where in the system I apply the twisting force, it's still going to be the same twist. Okay, we can, it's a little bit tricky to think about, because if you think about, again, if I use my paper here and talk about pinning it here and twisting it versus pinning it over here and twisting it. It looks like different motion, but there's also some lateral motion here too. If you look at this, it's moving up and to the right as I twist it there. If I hold it here, it move it this way or here. Now it's moving left and right as well as rotating. In terms of pure rotational motion, it doesn't matter where you apply it. You can apply this moment anywhere in the system where it makes it easier for you. So in the case of a problem where you've got a complex system, uh, where oftentimes you have moments applied to different places, that gets complicated. A couple of moments are nice because you can move them and put them wherever it's convenient in order to solve the problem. Okay, so that does bring us to the end of this chunk uh, before we move on to the next piece uh, with the other half of chapter four. So, time. some confusion on the last example I did using finding moment about an axis. I'm going to go through that a little bit more slowly here, so hopefully people can understand what, what pieces came from where. Uh, I was also a little sloppy with my notation, so that needs to be adjusted a little bit as well. Um, so what we had was we had the, we had this looking at R cross F moment equals U dot R cross F where we had uh, U was three, negative three plus R plus four fifths J. We had R equals negative three R plus four J plus six J. F was given as Now, I showed two different ways to do this, R cross F and then dotting with U, or trying to do it all at once. The advantage of doing it all at once is that you've only got the one step, obviously. This ends up looking like negative 3 fifth, 4 fifth, 0, negative 3, 4, 6, negative 40, 20, 10. Okay. Where I got lazy or where I made my mistake was I left ij's and k's in here, okay? When you're crossing r cross f, when you're finding the total moment without the unit vector here, you have ij and k in here. Again, that would just be ij k, 3, 4, 6, negative 4, 40, 20, 10. Just taking regular moment r cross f. When you add in this dot product, we end up adding this other vector here. We lose the ij and k. Okay, we're not dealing with the Cartesian unit vectors. We have our own unit vector here, i, j, and k being the Cartesian unit vectors. We have our own unit vector, minus 3 fifths, 4 fifths, and 0. Okay, this, because it's a dot product, produces a scalar result. 
Okay, so the answer to this, we do the determined here, we end up with negative 3 fifths times 4 times 10 minus 1 times 6, and carry on to the determinant. We end up with an answer of 120, right? And this is moment, so it's Newton meter. This, the result, the result of this is the magnitude, and only the magnitude of the moment So this is what we have as the magnitude. This is what we get out of our determinant, out of our u dot r cross f. This yields a scalar, which is a mag which is the magnitude of the moment about u. If you want the vector, okay, if you want the vector in terms of its components, well, we have the magnitude, and we know the direction is along the, the unit vector here. So the moment vector, so to be fair, this is that. Right? The moment vector is m times u, or in this case, 120 times negative 3 fifths i plus 4 fifths j. This is the result of the example that we finished at the end of the last clip. I didn't do, I, apparently I did not do a good enough job explaining the difference between uh, the, scalar product, the scalar product here producing the magnitude and then multiplying by the unit vector again at the end in order to get the vector in terms of its Cartesian.